a group that is intended to be interviewed, that the researcher intends to collect the data on. So what it tells you is that you could target that particular group. It could be a household, it could be an individual, you and me, it could be a group of teachers, it could be a group of firms or companies. So this is what is all a cross-section. A cross-section basically comes from the population. Remember last we spoke about population. So we could think about the, if you look at uh, Busia County, for example, Busia County, assuming that this is the map of the county itself, and you're interested in studying the financing, uh, government financing or the county government commitments to a particular project, it's with education or health or programs like that. So what it means is that you could target, uh, you want to maybe study the implications of that kind of financing on the efficiency of education uh, institutions in the county. So it means then your unit analysis becomes perhaps the schools. So in this case, I have identified schools in within the county and so I be able to demarcate, for example, this into uh, five regions, A, B, C, D, E. So the units of analysis, the cross-section will be now the schools. If this is high school, whichever school. So we have five, we call this is, we can, we can now say the schools becomes the cross-section. So this is the unit of analysis. So once you've identified schools, which have even grouped into five categories, we are now saying that as a researcher, you develop your data collection tool. By data collection tool, it could be a questionnaire. It could be your, perhaps, your interview guide. So what we mean by cross-sectional data is the fact that on the day of the research, the researcher or his uh, or assistants will now visit these five regions sub or sub-regions and collect data of interest as at that point. So in this case, it becomes a cross-section, a cross-section because you've selected through sampling, you've identified your, your key variable, which is or rather the, the research group, which is schools, and you have developed using the sampling techniques that you have identified. For example, this could be stratified sampling where you have five strata. And so the units of analysis will now be the schools. And so because you are going to study at that very moment, this will be maybe 30th of January, 2024. So in this case, because you will collect the data at that very day, then it becomes cross-section because you are referencing it to a single point in time. So if the same study is repeated six months later in the month of July, 30th of July, 24, then it ceases to be cross-section because you've, you've kind of repeated the study. What that means is that you are likely to interview different individuals at the, compared to the one that you had before. So it now becomes a different uh, kind of data. So what it means is that because of the nature of the problem or research question you have, it will indicate to you that you are want to perhaps look at, you want to assess the level of satisfaction or whether efficiency is high or low and the like. So a cross-section means that you want to get data at that very moment. And from the data that you can get from the field, then you can analyze using various methods. So this is one of such an example that is data collected at a single point in time. The idea is that you must identify what is your cross-section. Cross-section, in this case, I can be interested in the group of schools. That's one of them. If your study is in a, in a different context, well, we can say, well, I want to, if you're a business-minded person, you want to understand the stock market behavior. So, well, we can now say, I want to target uh, maybe the, the top 20 listed companies. Companies 
at the Nairobi Securities Exchange. So this becomes your cross-section. As long as you co collect data on these 20 listed companies, at that very moment, it could be the, the month of January, it could be the first quarter of the year, it could be at the end of the six months, it, or at the end of the year. So as long as you're able to identify that time point, at what point are we doing this? Is it a single day, like in the first example that I've given here? Is it the first quarter of the, of the year? Is it the first half of the year? or it's at the end of the year. So it doesn't matter what time span, as long as you are making reference to one single point in time, then it becomes cross-section. Majority of, um, actually, is a significant, if not 100% of the studies that involve primary data is cross-sectional in nature because you go to the field, you have a questionnaire, you get data at that very moment. So that is what is called a cross-sectional data set. Let's, let's move to a second, a, a second category. Now, this is called time series. So the question here is that, suppose you collect the same um, data on the same variable over time at regular time interval. I'm looking at it at different time points. Then naturally, depending on how frequently you visit the same entities to collect data on, then you develop what is called a time series. That's a time series. So think about in the education field, you would want maybe uh, you look at the path, the trends, you want to look at the trends in uh, government financing of maybe uh, university education. And you, from the Ministry of Education, you can actually develop or rather come up with a data set which can span to as long as you can think about, as long as they are available. So they can give you data at the end of every year. So you have what is called an annual data. They can give you data at every quarter, at the end of the each and every quarter. They can decide and tell you, well, we have data available, but we have compiled them at the end of every every month. So it's now you to say, um, I'm interested from the period 2000 to 2023. So here, as long as you are targeting the same variable, which is government financing, over time, then you develop what is called a time series. Naturally, every data point can, can uh, result in a time series, as long as you become consistent in the same in the same variable. So I cannot be able to say, I'm looking at expenditure maybe in education, and then I combine with another uh, variable expenditure in some other thing and you form a series. No, it has to be the same variable consistently followed up over time. Right, can I hear from Tasleen? Um, thank you, thank you so much. I just have a question. Yes. Um, in time series data, Um, I'm thinking of a time when I was carrying out this research. So we did, um data collection uh, before any intervention was done to uh, a sample or a group of people. And then after now the intervention was done and finished, uh, we did another one at the end called Endline. Is this what is called time series data? Well, it is a stricter version of that. All you have in your case, you have an experimental group and a control group. Is that what you're saying? that you are doing pre and post. Yes. Yeah. So in that case, it is a little bit stricter in the sense that you're only concerned with two time points. So as long as you are having a, anything more than one time point, it is still time series because you've given, you've, you've collected data before, you've recorded the observation. After a duration, many things have changed along the way. Going back, as long as you are going back to the same kind of variable, observe what has happened, then you can say over time, this has happened. So the only difference will now come in how you will analyze that kind of data. So someone, yeah, so I will be able to now say um, pre and post analysis because you are strictly, you are strictly looking at two time points. So, Another person would now say, because I've been following this group 
for the last 20 years, then the method of analysis will also differ because I'm no longer interested in perhaps, I'm not interested in the before and after, but I'm looking at trends, what has happened on this variable across time. So it is a time series, yes, only that you will now need different techniques to analyze it. Fine. Um, I'm sure most of you run uh, intervention programs, even at, at, at your workplaces. Uh, you could be able to look at uh, perhaps um, uh, child health outcomes, you know, before and after immunization, disease prevalence, before and after intervention. So those becomes intervention studies. And there are various methods that you can apply uh, that you one can be able to analyze the same. Partly it could be from as simple as, as observational to even more complicated models that one can build. So that's what it is. But in time series, we um, have given the general picture that as long as you're able to track through a variable across time, but then you must be able to have regular intervals. That is what it means. So um, if you have, if you think about this, um, I'm also propping you to think of the sources of this data. At least for the first category, I've said you could have your questionnaire open or closed ended. You can have your interview guide. You can have your focus group discussions and the rest. So tell me, for time series, where is the source? Let me get some chats, sir. Can you respond on the chat as we think of other things? Secondary uh, data. Yeah, where will we get this data from? I want you to think in your field of um, expertise, is there a source of such kind of data which I can quickly run to, to collect data on, which is secondary? So, report? seen observation, um, reports, somebody says reports of um, which reports? Let's give specific. Okay, uh, in a school setting, yes. for example, we can use the registers, class registers, to check the the students' attendance, like on a daily basis or maybe weekly basis, and make decisions based on that data. Okay. All right. Fine. You can develop weekly reports. We can weekly data and the like. Fine. Um. Someone mentioned observation. How is that working? How about observation? Um. Think about. If it's, a, if it's about observation, then it must be matched with recording. You observe, then you record. Think of temperatures and things like that. Observation, recording. Then uh, a trend analysis, say, of the dollar against a shilling. Yeah, okay. So we could have, uh, yes, so, so th th those, th that is possible. But I importantly, we will take note of the fact that to a large extent, this secondary data is or rather exists in various databases. So it is important to note that uh, databases play a critical role in accessing the same. And I think you can you can look at many. In your, in your progress reports in your schools, if you look at your mean grade or your school over time, so you're trying to compare your performance for the last 20 years, but with so many assumptions being left shelved, you, you could see uh, the numbers can be different. Uh, you control for many other variables, so that as you look at your mean GPS or mean uh, performance, mean scores for your, for your form fours, for the last 20 years, well, you should also note that you will take that noting the assumptions that are there. Maybe the, there could be a shift in terms of the structure of the school. At what point there could be boys' schools only, then it became mixed. You could have maybe different streams so that the population numbers are different. So many dynamics can be, can be you can control for many of those other things. So think of uh, that. I will mention the sources at some point, particularly um, 
through. So, so what, do I, what, what, what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that it is possible to record some of these observations and track them through time. And uh, the important thing with this is that the techniques for analysis for time series is slightly different from the way you handle the normal uh, cross-section. I have given a few examples here on characteristics, frequencies. Frequency has to do with how, I mean, the in time interval. Are you doing it daily, monthly, weekly, annual, etc.? Then uh, with time series, most of us will easily develop trends. And I think with trends, you understand what it means. With your trend, you can now have your main variable and then try to get the picture through time. Uh, so this, uh, yes, please. Um, maybe another good example would be looking at a, a retail store where you look at the customer database and maybe uh, you look at the frequencies of what they buy, the products they buy, and you come up with the trends on what is currently trending in terms of the statistics of the customers of what they're buying from there, you can be able to make decisions. Okay, oh, all right, let me take that and then perhaps make it a little bit better. Yeah, so it's, if it's about products, it might, you might need now to identify which is your variable there. Are you, are you tracking the number of products being bought? Uh, a good statistic there could be things to do with the sales. You know, how much, what is your daily revenue from sales so that you can have it, you can track a measurable uh, a variable and track it through time. Or you can have a database of your loyal customers. You know, from history, you can have your loyal list of loyal customers. And then see on average, is uh, are the number of loyal customers in your store consistently five, six, or the rest, or is it growing over time? So the idea is that you need to look at a variable you're measuring across time and try to ask, is there a rising trend or is it decreasing over time? Yeah, so that is a good example. Thank you. Yeah, so all these scores I'm seeing people are putting on the chat, they are valid. They are valid. So, but I hope you get the point. For those of us who are in business, if you are a farmer, you can always develop a, a trend in terms of, you can consider maybe your production levels in the farm. Controlling for many other factors, if you are a coffee farmer, or if you are a wheat farmer, as long as you're consistently maintaining the acreage of your farm, I can be able to say that over time, my yield has been either increasing then decreases a little bit, increases again, there is some fluctuations along the way. So depending on how these are. So this is could be, for example, the yield of corn or maize in your, in your farm. So what I wanted to bring, why, why I was drawing this, this particular graph is to bring to you an important characteristic of time series. These special times where you seem to have some not so consistent or uh, not so con a constant trend. There is some noise at some point. Could be because of one or two reasons. So this is why time series become very powerful. You can be able to say, well, much as there is an increasing trend in my yield over time, but I notice particular characteristics, the particular fluctuations we call these ones fluctuations around certain years or as a, around certain periods of the time of the year. So this is, this is sometimes we call the seasonality. You might want to develop it. You can be able to track perhaps your stocks, your sales revenues, or rather your revenues for your business. And you notice that at some consistent periods of time, around December, Something is always happening. In the middle of the month, there's always a noise around, around the same. If this was years, you say, well, uh, during election periods in, in the country, 
I seem not to have consistent uh, increases in cells. There's always some noise around the same. So that gives you power to now analyze and give more storyline to tell. So um, in your in education field, for some of us, I think majority of us are in education. Uh, feel free to engage maybe the records maintained at the county government. Yeah, the Department of Education. See what records are maintained from the time we had county governments. Do they maintain data on financing? Do they give you, do they have data on maybe um, a um, number of uh, education establishments in the county? Has it been increasing and the rest? So think about that. So much as uh, you would want to uh, develop a questionnaire, you go to interview people, I know we would want to do that as well. Have you ever thought about also looking at the databases that you do yeah, that exists, but it must be authentic or rather renowned. You just can't go to anywhere and collect data and say, this is it. So it has to be the, the, the problem with second with this secondary data thing is the fact that it must be from an authenticated or authentic source. And I think there's a slide to uh, that 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 highlights that. So this I have just given three characteristics of times of time series. Um now this is third category. Uh, this is called a pooled data set. Pool data set now is interesting because here you combine both cross section and time series so that you have a very big uh, data set which combines, which has both effects. I want to give an example to make it better. Um, we know that we have about 43, 44 <clears throat> commercial banks in Kenya. Think about the commercial banks that we do have, <clears throat> we have the Taiwan, the Taiwan commercial banks. Then uh, you'd want to consider a variable of interest or a set of variables in of interest um, from their data set or from the records. They could be keeping information data on deposit levels. Uh, how much has been their deposits? How much have they lent? So this is the lending or credit extended and the rest. So we have a bank manager in the house. Thank you very much. I think we need to invite that one. Just who is this person? <laughs> we have, okay, now. Well, it's okay. We have a bank, banker. Let's say banker in the house. <laughs> yes. Let us know the variables they maintain in the bank. Okay. But it, I think Josephine, you can tell us these variables, I'm not the bank. By profession, but we have a bank manager here. Okay. So Justin, I think we are very low today on the speaker. We can't hear. Okay, I'm a teacher, but Frank <laughs> is the bank manager. Uh, Frank, tell us something about the variables. Eh? Ah, nice. Even the answer is there. Tell us the data maintained by any typical commercial bank. We will not come for <laughs> employment with the bank. Tell us something. Variables. Hi, Dr. Lee. Great. Thank you. Nice. Yes, yes. Uh, some of the variables we maintain are things like um, the number of customers, the number of accounts. Mm -hmm. The okay, number of, of branches. Uh, network. Yes. Good. Good. Uh huh. Number of new, new accounts open. I like that one. The accounts we could be, we can say this time around we want the new ones so that we can assess the performance of the marketing team. The rest. Yeah. We also so, have so, um, uh -huh. the, edge, the, last... the edge of our customers. Eh? 
We can call Perfect. it the customer profile. Profiles. Yeah, customer profile. Profiles of the customers. Yeah. Let me thank you, thank you, Frank. Let's let's reflect on a few of these. Let's look at the volume of credit lent to individuals. Then I also want to look at their branch networks. I'd like to know how much they also receive in terms of deposit. So I want to look at those three to illustrate the point. So the fact that I have um, at least, let's take the top five. Yeah, top five. I think, Frank, which are the tire ones in the industry? ACB is one of them. Equity Bank, Cooperative Bank, NCBA, NCBA, yeah. Any other? DTB, Absa, Absa, uh, and Stanchat. So we have this other one. Yeah. So I want we now say that. Uh, so we have those. I assume we go with those seven. So if I'm able to collate the variables of interest from these uh, uh, banks, looking at their branches, branch networks, looking at the credit extension, looking at how much they receive in deposits, but for a given period of time, take for example, the annual, then you can develop what is called a panel data. The structure of a panel data will proceed as follows. So what it means is that how, how the variables of interest being three. So this is my deposits. So this is my the lending, and this is the branches, the branch network. So what, what happens is that you now split this into various groups. So for illustration purposes, I'll have KCB. And perhaps I have, uh, let's say, APSA. So what it therefore you need to do is that you need to look at the time period. So I want to say from the year 2010, 2011, all the way to 2023. I do the same thing for the second group, 2010, 2011, all the way to 2023. So what what... What that tells you is that you have a very huge balanced data set which comprises of three variables, but each of these three variables is measured for the number of uh, entities of interest. And for each entity, I'm measuring this for a period of 14 years, 2010 to 2023, that's 14 years. So therefore, the purpose of forming what is called a panel data is for you to increase or have more data points. So in this example, the number of uh, commercial banks are our cross sections. Typically, we can call that one N cross sections. And then I want to consider the time period from the year 2010 to 2023, this is my time point. I'm going to call it T, and this would be 14 years. So what that tells you is that in a nutshell, you will have T times N observations. So this is your N. So how many observations will you have? I will have 14 years, and there will be measuring this on perhaps seven banks. So in total, you're now dealing with 98 observations. Ninety-eight observations. Now it now for each variable. So for deposits I have 95, 98 data points for 
lending rates, I have that, and then also for the number of uh, firms. And that is how you develop what is called a panel data. The purpose is that you may find that in some situations, if you study the three variable, the three, I mean, the seven, seven uh, commercial banks, it is too few for analysis. So if I, let's say, I want to do cross-section for the seven, seven uh, commercial banks, it's too few. If I want to look at the time, the data that these variables are measured, if they are only available for 14 years, then I cannot study it alone as time series of 14 years because it's too few. In statistics, um, with, as I told you last time, sample size is very important. The higher the number, the better. Yes, I believe someone is asking if I'm. Sh sh you can see my screen. I think I am sharing the screen. Yes, I. So for those who are not seeing, please, uh, you can just assess from your, you from your end. So why do we use panel data? Is because of that fact that you want to have more Doctor, observation. Yes, please. Is it possible you expand the screen? Okay. Let's see whether it's possible to do that. Uh, at the top, uh, I guess, left corner, there is that um, icon there before the X. Uh, before the X, I think uh, for... Before the check. X, there is a dash and then that icon and then X at the top. I want to... Just a moment. Let me see whether you can, can do it differently. Is it better a little bit? It's fine. I think um, it just will be... yes, please. Fine. I think we, we could be okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay, yeah. It's okay. Remember, I'm using a yes, it's fine. P PDF come word. Eh? Yeah, so at times this is not in the presentations for the slides, so that's why at times that will work. That will work. I think we can see. So that's fine. So this is the, I'll increase the font size going forward in terms of what I'm going to be writing on board. So what I've said is um, in a nutshell, this category referred to as panel is very powerful because it, it um, helps you to counter the limitations of time series and cross-sectional cross data independently. So choose for yourself, as you design your questionnaire, as you design your study, you have many options. You have a variety of options to choose from. I know the majority of us would prefer the professional data because you want to interview, you want to do this and this. That is still possible. Remember uh, what we said last week, I think I should be repeating this every other class session, that this course, you must find a way in which it aligns to your research methods. So that when we speak about uh, methodologies, um, the different um, different uh, research designs, then when we speak, when they talk of uh, descriptive research design, when we speak about correlational research design, and then you can now picture that particular uh, research design with the data you you intend to collect. From the data you collect, then you can now choose the method of analysis. So at some point, we, as we look through the various statistical methods available, then you can tie the pieces together. Good. Something, something to, to reflect on this uh, slide. Very careful. You should be very cautious when it comes to data, which is uh, time series because what it means is that you must be careful the source of the data. It must be from official sources. Uh, in your field of study, where you come from, if you're in the banking industry, you can have your research team, your research department, or the central bank, which collects the data from all the commercial banks. If um, you work for the government, at the counties, they maintain data, at the national government, there are also data maintained at different uh, institutions. Um, for data on the economy and other variables, you 
definitely you make use of the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. That's where you get most of these published official sources. Otherwise, um, you could also see, think of external, external sources, external sources in the sense that uh, there are those renowned databases worldwide where you can collect data even on education, literacy levels, enrollment rates for different age groups. So the World Bank, the UN, they have huge volumes of data sets available. So uh, think about uh, the data set you are using for your research. And as says, each of them has their own characteristics though, and also weaknesses and strengths. But for, for time series data, you must be careful because the, the, the people who compile this data have had their own uh, purposes of doing that they, for public consumption, but they never have had you in mind that one day you'll come and use it. So it's upon you to tailor make your research to suit what they have. I've given you examples in this slide where such could be a, at the national level, regional level, internationally, companies and the, and the like, even in your own schools. But this is the one that you should exercise caution. Never rely on some other sources, as you can see. I'm sure you can look at Facebook, most of us, Twitter, all these. These are not authentic for research. So ensure that it is authentic. Much as someone, even if someone records or rather gets the data and then posts them in their Facebook page, that is still not authentic. It must be from the credible sources. I think this one, everyone is very aware um, for cross-sectional data where you can get. Uh, I think someone gave an example of the pre-test, post-test experiments where you have a control group and there are non-control groups. You can have your close-ended end, end, questionnaires. Uh, think about that. So different institutions have different ways in which they can specify the requirements for their questionnaires, your interview guide questions and the rest. I'm sure most of us are very comfortable in this space and uh, it, is some, it is something to take note of. At this stage, we will not look at uh, what the merits, whatever the merits that is, that, is, that is for another forum. As we listen to Cindy. Yes, Dr. Tari, are you, are you sending this note? Uh, it's after the lesson, I will post just like I did the other one. Excuse me, Dr. Ari. You're moving too fast. Oh, am I too fast? Excuse me, Dr. Ari. All right. Excuse me. Excuse, please go on. Okay, I just found these notes on the portal. They are on the student, uh, they are on the door online portal. Mm. <clears throat> okay. I don't know that I, I, this, yeah, this one, I had posted this last week. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I, I I actually posted for the first and the second. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that one. The, no, the one that I'm yet to post is the one that will be in the next section, this one. But this one is already available. And then, Dr. Week. Terry? Yes. I just saw on the portal, we have a quiz uh, starting at 8. Today. We will figure out. Oh, okay. We will figure out what happens. Right. Yeah, so, <clears throat> yes, I know, I'm aware that, uh, yes, uh, we will uh, ask you to just put on one or two questions. These are about uh, measurement levels. So we did, uh, at around 8, I'll give you a quiz, 20 minutes or so, as we end. It's all about uh, data um, le levels of measurement and the, right, and the like, just for us to figure out where we whether we understand data or not. Yeah, so let's let's just uh, continue. Then uh, there is a discussion question as well. I think it will go live at around um, seven or thereabout. But that one will be for us to contribute and give your perspectives, so that I also see that we are participating. Yeah. So understand the understand the issues of data, uh, so that uh, at around eight o'clock I'll ask you to just log in then ask to answer them some basic two questions about uh, the nature of data.
what I've what we've spoken about this earlier when we began, the various levels of data. So just to recap, just for a recap, please remember what we did here. Re recap what nominal variables are. So think about categories which may have no meaning. Think about data which has which is categorical, but it has some meaning, or there's a way you can assign some meaning to the same. Think about a data set which can be measured along an equal scaling. So for example, those that you can measure as whole numbers, one, two, three, four, and the rest, as long as you have an equal spacing in between. And then the ratio is the highest where you can now consider the decimals, including the zeros. So this is the highest, which each encompasses everything on the quantitative side. So here we're dealing with quant data. And then below here we have qual. So uh, the quiz I'll give you at some point is to reflect on some data points and then do the classifications. So that is something, uh, that's a very simple exercise. Yeah, so we have, we, we know that after, we have not yet started computation though. I think that will be next week some computation. So right now we are good. Can you can I proceed? Yes. Thankfully. I so if in case of anything if the recording is here, you can always do a recap. Good. So I had mentioned this, the sources of the uh, secondary now primary data which you all are aware. Um I want to leave certain uh, things for your research for you to fill in, in your research. For example how to design a, a focus group discussion, what is the minimum, maximum number, then how do you even analyze it when it comes to observation, how do you observe then record and the rest, temperature, traffic flow, all this. So this is what it is. But of course, you know that the, the merits, the merits of the primary data is that it's focused to your research. That's the key thing. And when designed properly, you are, answering the questions that you are you intend for your research. Um, so the second, this section is the one that I said it will be for you because it's all about the sampling methodologies that exist for data collection. So uh, we will not go there, but the flowchart here just gives you an overview of where we are. So your data set can either fall on the secondary sphere, sphere or the primary. For primary data, you can either call it qual or quant. So for quant, there are many things, exper experiments, observations, you can do a surveys. So your surveys can now come in form of questionnaires and the rest. Then uh, for qual, this is now, um, you know, you are now explore by getting in-depth discussions and analysis of a in a certain a particular area. And so this is where we have the uh, FGDs, uh, focus group discussions, at these interviews and the rest. So many things do arise. Just wanted to, so that I leave this section for you, deductive and inductive in your research. Someone to recap for us. It's just a question out of out of the deductive versus inductive reasoning in research. Professor's class, volunteer. Is it Brenda or Brian? <laughs> oh yes, yeah, there's someone. Othello, good evening, sir, proceed. Okay, I will just give a, yeah, I have some neighbors, but let me just say something. Deductive, it is from, uh, that, that kind of thinking is from general to specific and inductive from specific to general. That's a simple way I can put it. Yeah, the simplest way you can put up. Yes. So in in inductive, you're moving from what? 
specific uh, to can general. I also add something, Doctor? Yes. Yeah, thank you. I I wanted to just have concurrence with the Othello to just have a According to him, inductive implies that you have uh, the reasoning, I mean, you're designing your studies from a specific to a general context, whereas the deductive is the opposite. Right, okay, let me then add, let me hear from who was speaking before, Brenda. Uh, was... Yes, Brenda, and then uh, this is Chris, yeah? After Brenda, we have Chris. Yeah, good evening, Dectary. Good evening to you. Uh, not much difference from what uh, Othello has said because deductive reasoning um, starts with, uh, we, we, we draw our conclusions from the general to specific conclusions, whereas inductive reasoning begins with being specific or having specific observations. Uh, and then we derive them towards the general uh, principles or conclusions. So deductive basically uh, narrows down to being certain, whereas inductive um, deals with probabilities. Okay, deduce. Eh? deduce. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, Chris is the last speaker for the day. <laughs> right. Let, let me agree with the with the two my colleagues and add yes. on and say that. Um, in inductive reasoning, as we move from from uh, general to specific, we begin with theoretical uh, 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 developing a theory, and then in the deductive, we then test that particular theory. Okay, perfect. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I think we are on course. Oh, nice. Now you know, as a teacher, when you see Obadiah. And you remember the book of Obadiah, you just, just don't want to tell him, keep quiet. Obadiah, what are you trying to say? Good evening, Mwali Mo. Good evening. I have a question pertaining to data collection methods. Yes. Uh, if I've really observed well, I can say we have a quantitative. Yes. And in one of the points, we have an observation. Uh -huh. I'm trying to link this information with what we've learned with a prof, uh, a question popped in my mind. Uh, yes. When you talk about hypothesis in uh, research, you're looking at an informed guess. So now my question goes like this. Uh, mm -hmm. Can a researcher test the hypothesis based on uh, uh, an observation? Okay. Mm -hmm. Can it be tested? Oh, yeah. Is that what you're saying? I'm asking a question. If okay. the hypothesis can be tested by an observation or through an observation. All right. Okay. Well, when it comes to, let me get somebody first of all to agree or wants to give their idea. Is it mm -hmm. possible he comes up again? Because I didn't hear his question. Uh, but yeah, please do come again. Okay, so now the question is this. Uh, we were taught that an hypothesis is an informed guess. Yes. And uh, after you've collected data, yes. you've analyzed it. Yes. In the representation, when you're presenting yes. data, <coughs> you have now to test your hypothesis, if I'm right. right. Yes. Now I'm saying this through mm -hmm. uh, this collection method mm -hmm. and uh, quantitative, this is yes. observation. Okay. Can a researcher now test the hypothesis based on the observation that he made? Okay. I think, uh, is the question clear now? I think it is very, and it's very particular. Can we test an hypothesis on the basis of observation? So that's what, that's what it is. First of all, let's look at what, what's an hypothesis. An hypothesis is basically, an, we can say it's an educated guess. That means that as a researcher, you're going to the field with some prior knowledge, with some informed uh, opinion about what you 
one-to-one -one test. So what I am presenting here is in this slide is the actual data collection process. But this uh, hypothesis, the researcher will have developed it well in advance. And for sure, observation is one of the ways or one of the sources of this hypothesis. First things first, being an educated guess or an informed guess or informed opinion about the context or the study variable, for instance, then for me, I'll say there are certain things I will have observed in the past. That will cut, which will now form the knowledge base. For example, I have, uh, I did indeed, I I drawn some graphs earlier. I think somewhere here there were some graphs I had drawn earlier, around here. I think something like this. Okay. So oh, this is about a, for example, um, financing government budget allocations for education sector. And you can see it's a rising trend, but there's some, there's some noises around certain periods. So one of the ways I can make an hypothesis is on the basis of observing this trend, I've seen the trend is a rising trend, but there are some bumps here and there. I can actually say, well, it seems this, this some bumps appear in certain periods. Well, if I observe and then I relate with what is happening on the ground, for example, I say, well, it seems around 2002, there was a shift in, there was an introduction of an education program. And so there was a sudden rise. Then around a certain period, because we had elections and there was uncertainty, there's a drop in financing and then before the trend picks up. So I can indeed say, well, it seems government programs affect or they are seem to affect a uh, government financing significantly. So I have observed the trends and I can relate those years with certain developments in this variable. So that is the that is where observation plays a role in you forming that hypothesis. That is just one source of it. The other source of uh, the hypothesis is perhaps uh, from from your theory. You know, specific theory, scientific theories. Oh, uh, you have theories in your area of speciality. Okay. Um, I mean, is there a theory linking? Um, the current exchange rate fluctuations with maybe the economy. So theories can help you to also come up with those things over the hypothesis. So at the end of it all, when you now look at those observations, the things you know, what is generally believed, what the, what the data is telling you, then now here is what I'm saying. I'm now collecting data to test that which I've brought on in the field. So I think uh, that, was, that was why we now brought in observation as one of those but this is perhaps maybe you want to like for example the example i gave in the slide about maybe collection of uh, temperatures recording temperatures recording traffic flows so if we had an observation or rather your study was some something about the traffic and rest then observation becomes one of the methods that you can gonna collect data on on traffic so i think your point now i hope i've tried to um explained as much as I could over there. Good. Right. So Doctor, let me then... Doctor, can I ask a question? Please proceed. When a doctor in a hospital tries to observe the heart rate in patients... Come, come again, come again. When, when a doctor when yes. a doctor tries to observe a heart rate or even yes. temperatures uh -huh. in patients, uh -huh. when a patient goes to the hospital, Correct. And then they record the they record down. Does that yes. become is it a qualitative observation or it's a quantitative observation? Well, if the question is uh, they observe. The question is what are they recording? 
that which they record now heart rate heart rate heart rate so what is the, what measures is it is uh yeah i think it now becomes a quantitative measure yes no, you know, that it becomes quantitative immediately you start to record the data yes i yeah. remember which has distance because yeah. the number must have distance correct correct mm. so it is true you can observe but remember, you can also observe. I don't know. Whether, is it possible to observe qualitative data? I'm not very sure. <laughs> or you observe behavior. Then, uh, from if your study is on behavior, I don't know how many of us in the in the social sciences or in psychology are you able to observe someone's behavior, then describe. I leave that for discussion for another day. But the question is, having observed, what are you recording? That now determines what it is. I think fair enough. Yes. Okay. Good. Let's proceed. I want to now ex uh, expect you to please read through the other things. The other things uh, when it comes to what things you need to, I think this could be a good guide. Uh, before you collect the uh, go to the field what what factors would affect your data collection methods and the rest so many things uh be it financing availability the degree of accuracy you want in your data set are you from a qual or a quant field so that you are exploring from a qualitative perspective you're exploring behavior you go without any hypothesis you just want to explore understand things get deeper meanings, and then in the end, develop theories. That's what it is. Or you are this type that goes with an hypothesis to be tested in the field. So there are many things that will influence your data and data collection approaches, which I think it is critical. Um, research ethics as well, I think, Ellen, are very well said. Um, there are areas in which data collection might require that you must seek several approvals because of ethics, then to what extent will that influence maybe your study? Is your study, must it be now aligned or rather if you're in the medical field then the questions of ethics comes in or you are dealing with uh, special people in the, in, the, in the society, the children and the rest, then there are many things in. I'm sure at some point this reliability validity I mean, before you analyze the data, you must also assess whether your tool is suitable to generate reliable um, conclusions. So, with that, um, I want we, I want to shelve this discussion, which you can go and now harvest and look up, look at, so that now I I can engage with you a little bit differently on the second segment. On the second segment, which is this one. So please, as as in passing, look through the details about all the other things, simple random sampling, systematic, all that, cluster sampling. You can look at that. So maybe uh, I had I put some tips there. Uh, the last two three slides for especially for people collecting data, which is quantitative. At times, at times you must be careful how the data has been captured, recorded, and stored for use in research. For example, um, if you look at literacy levels, uh, are you talking about adult literacy? Is it about uh, at the youth level, the children? So many measures exist of the same variable, measures of the same variable, OK? Was the data collected and cleaned? Are there any missing data? How accurate is it? Because sometimes you can collect data from two authentic sources, and you find there's a slight discrepancy, even when you when you look at the actual numbers. It is because sometimes the method that they use to clean, to calculate, to collect the statistics may vary a little bit. For example, um, in the field where I, where I come from, this inflation an inflation uh, variable, okay, then uh, it's it comes from the 
consumer price index. That is the Kenya Kenya National Bureau of Statistics or monitors the prices of specific basket of goods. And then they have different methods of compute, computing the index. So depending on what, uh, which product uh, many people consume, which product is more volatile in terms of the prices, they are given a, a more, they are given more weight in the index. So when they are doing this, the assumptions are different. So you may find that the inflation numbers recorded in by KNBS or the one in the World Bank could be slightly different by a few points. So that will represent now, much as that is a picture, you might want to now draw the, 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 the trend to just compare, does it, do they match on a nutshell? So I'm just giving you a scenario that at times you might need to also consider the level of accuracy for which this is uh, recorded. For primary data, um, you must look at many things, research ethics, procedures, uh, protocols, any uh, financial commitments. You think about how you record, how you code, how you clean the data, how you input in a data processing uh, software. So many things will come into the picture. So the question is, how you, do you have method techniques that you can handle data of whichever type, whether it is uh, categorical or continuous. So reflections on that at some point, um, it comes to the experience. Just wanted to, let me go to the last statement here, which is a uh, data processing. You, you collect data from different sources. For those of us in uh, qualitative data focused group discussions, you know how you will analyze that kind of data so that you can develop themes. But uh, from a quant perspective, the idea is once you have your questionnaire, you've collected data by observations or questionnaire itself, you must now look, sit down, consider each of them as every, is every questionnaire field. Well, is there, are there gaps? This is now the data editing and cleaning without necessarily changing the observations in the field. You clean the data, you might want to drop some observations if you find that there are extreme values in the system in, in, among the many. So that's why they say that you must collect with from as many as possible and should be as large as you can, you know. But there are, um, I think most of us know that you can as well also develop a mechanism, a scientific way of determining a sample size. There are many formula out there in research, you can look at it. So that as you go to the field, you know that from a population of target population of 300, maybe um, 150 is still sufficient or 50 or whatever, whatever, depending on the approach you use. So once you do that, you can clean, uh, you can uh, decide now to group, then you code into a computer software, then you start organizing the data either in Excel, in uh, whichever other software, then now you can now begin to analyze. So to me, uh, this is a very important step in as far as uh, data uh, analysis is concerned, do you understand the process of processing it? So that before we, we put all things together, um, you already have what you want. Is it frequencies you are looking for? Is it um, graphs and the rest? Sometimes for time series, this is this is what you call, you, it is good to have a feel of the data, meaning, you can just do very basic summary statistics, like which what we shall be doing in this uh, in the next few chapters. Get to know which is the maximum lowest value, which is the average, what's the standard deviation. Uh, you look at those skewness and all that. Then you can even do some preliminary graphs to look at patterns. From the patterns, you can actually pick whether whether there is a an extreme value, particularly this thing called a scatter plot diagram. From a scatter plot diagram, you can now, when you see the dots there, you may find that there's an extreme value which is different from the other. So you might be forced to go back and say, this one is likely to bias the results. And because you use a scientific method to, to collect the data, doing away with it may not necessarily harm the research as such. Then from there, you can now proceed to do your analysis. Your, your analysis can now be as per your questionnaire or as per your objectives. What do you want to do? 
do you want to do hypothesis testing? Do you want to do correlation? Do you want to do a regression? Do you want to just uh, plot simple trends and the rest? That's what it is. Sometimes if it's hypothesis testing, that it must be preceded by normality test. You test for whether the norm is normal distribution of the data and the like. So in quantitative, that will be uh, the approach you take. Anything I have left out for this section? I hope hope you've uh, gained as much as you already know, Obadia. Yes, Malimo, a very quick one. Huh? I want to yeah. take you back to where you talked about um, uh, those few tips huh, that we should look at. Huh? How do you bridge the gap uh, uh, maybe between two authors huh? that where, where where we have a missing um a missing data maybe they uh, they have like a demography uh, they have maybe a difference of uh, maybe twenty people maybe mm -hmm. one stated that maybe uh that the entire demography was like the participant or maybe it's uh, let me say it's a crusade. Huh? Mm -hmm. And that I said, you a researcher states that um, uh, 500 people attended the crusade and 50 yes. percent got born again. Mm -hmm. The second one states that that same same crusade, it's only 40, uh, 400 people who participated and uh, 50 percent got baptized or got con uh, um, uh, converted how mm -hmm. would you how would you uh, uh bridge that gap now as maybe a new researcher or uh the person who is conducting a new research of uh, maybe that crusade and you want to use uh maybe uh the output that their contributions how would you ensure that uh the data that you are, uh, the information that you are getting from these two authors will not compromise uh, uh, re the results that you'll get in mm -hmm. the end. Okay, I'm trying to, I don't know the, qu the question is clear, but uh, you present a situation where you have two authors. Um, is it two authors or two researchers? Yeah, two uh, authors. Uh, mm -hmm. So what I know is that <clears throat> you had the researcher, right? And then uh, you, as a researcher, you have your guiding objectives and uh, questions that you seek to achieve in the field. From a quantitative point of view, okay, the process really uh, implies that the, you must get your sampling correctly, which means that that means it falls from the methodology to design and the rest. As to whether you would want to uh, <clears throat> drop an observation or not, now the researcher must now assess. You, you make an assessment as to whether is this observation significantly, is it way off from the overall? And that's why instincts can now guide you by what I said earlier, Having organized and everything, are you seeing any peculiar observations within the group? You might not necessarily uh, rely on what the other author has said. As long as that is not confirmed by many others, then I don't think you, you would flow in in that way. But if the common trend in the literature is that by dropping an extreme observation, you are likely to achieve perhaps more reliable resource, results, then, then that should be it. But uh, if that step that you are say, you are saying that it's, you are the two others or an other is saying this, but there's no other, uh, there's no other perhaps backing from the literature, then I don't think it's safe to follow that approach. But in my view, from my, ex from my own experience, as a researcher, if you have done your due diligence with, in terms of the, 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 the methodological structure of it, by the time you get to the data collection, if the other steps are very okay, then even with dropping over a single variable, you are less likely to affect your analysis, simply because you've received, you, you have a significant 
um, I mean, you have you've received from a majority of the of, of the of the people. The other problem could be maybe if you have a category of of of, of respondents, and perhaps in your in I don't know in a, in a certain category. If it's for example, you're interviewing managers. Um, uh, operations, I mean, top management, middle management, maybe other stuff. So you have so that kind of categories. It might it might be important to assess for each of the levels or for each of the strata. Do you have representation? That is key. You may have you may notice that you are dropping two observations. Yes, these could be the key ones from the top management whom ordinarily may not be as many. So it means in that case, it might conscience or rather their conscience might indicate to you that you don't need you don't need to drop that. So in my view, it is a matter of um what is it that you have? What is your response rate for the different categories? And have you done your due diligence in terms of the process of designing the study? If that if everything is done well, then I don't expect much of a problem. One of the characteristics from uh, something else to just tie it up, from my experience in quantitative research, a good uh, methodology is one in which if by dropping a single observation, you don't alter the results as much, then it is still a good model. Problem is when you have a single tweak in the data and it's an entire shift. That's why if you want to test your data times, you might rerun your model with different adjustment to the sample and see how your results are affected. If you find there's a significant shift, then it means that there might be something wrong from the onset. But I'm sure it comes from experience. Okay, after collecting your data and realize it's not accurate, do you start afresh? Now, the question is, uh, then I don't want to say yes or no. Um, if you find that you have, you don't have accurate data. Naturally, if that is confirmed, then you must go back. Because at the end of it all, you must, the idea is that the objectives must be met. I think it is it's as simple as that. So this research is scientific. So that's why at every point, there has to be checks and balance. So as you design your design, research design, is it the correct one? You, you move to the next one, is your population correctly identified? Do you have representation? Is the sample size accurate? So when you see all these things are falling into place, is your data collection tool um, reliable, then I don't expect uh, much trouble. For quantitative data, it might be it might be easy for you to go back. If it is if you are doing a quantitative data based on secondary data, for example, from the databases, yeah, you might want to alter the definition of a certain variable because some variables. Some variables out there exist in the database and they are measured differently, yet they measure the same thing. Yeah. So I want to give you an example in economics. There's this variable referred to as the GDP, that is the income for the economy, gross domestic product, GDP for the country. Well, it is a measure of your income, but there's another alternative measure referred to as the income per capita. That is income per person. It is still measuring the same idea. It does not negate the entire meaning. But in terms of research, you can one can contextualize and say, well, whether you went income per capita or income in the same, the results seems to be better in this way. And so you can justify it along those lines. So as long as you are, you are aligning yourself within the same kind of space. So food for thought, food for thought. Good, let me just uh, then, uh, I know at some point I must let you stretch and then get some 
moment to just uh, look at the question that I've posted the quiz. Yeah, so I um, um, yes, yes, please. Can I just say something? Is it possible at some point when you are doing data analysis to use one, I mean, two or more of the, the uh, methods of analysis? For example, you're talking about uh, whether it's going to be correlation or regression and things like that. Okay. Must you must rely okay. on any one of those things. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Good question. First of all, um, your your research research objectives guides you on the approach. Generally speaking, generally speaking, a good, a stronger, uh, a strong uh, research will adopt more than one method of analysis. You've given an example of regression correlation. The theory, the theory of regression, in my view or rather from experience, is that correl a correlation precedes regression. It's, it's natural. You, because the, when we get to that topic, you'll, you'll see the sense. Correlation talks about relationships. Um, countries which have, for example, um, high GDP tend to have low inflation rate. So there's a relationship between inflation and GDP. So that's a relational issue. And so if I'm trying to understand whether inflation affects GDP, then I'll need a regression model. So you can do a regression after you've determined that there's some correlation. So as you, as you get to that stage, you can say, well, in the first step, we have done this. You have done the correlation. And upon establishing that the variables are relating with each other, then I proceed in the next step to perform a, a regression model. And that is acceptable. If you are, if you are dealing with, a, a, you gave you an example of secondary data on ed, in education. You go to the Ministry of Education, you collect a huge data set on many things, enrollments, number of institutions, all these things. Even if you are not, you're looking at the relationship between uh, financing and performance of schools, there's no harm doing a graph like this to just demonstrate the trends in expenditures in schools. So this is one way of analyzing the data graphically so that it's this graph supports the numbers you're going to give later on. So it's always good practice to have richer analysis of your data. Good. Are we think we are good up to there. Much of this we will talk about as we go along. Allow me to spend a few minutes to introduce this very basic introduction to data presentation. Um, the way how the way we do this one will be very different. I know back in the day we used to draw graphs manually. You go to the you have your paper, you have your pen, you have your y-axis, x-axis, draw histogram, many things like those. But nowadays, um, uh, with the advent of uh, these packages that we do have, it's very easy. So, um, so in this section, we are going to look at three ways in which we can describe the data. The first one is graphics. Then the second one is the numbers, which is the central tendency, and now the inferentials. And, and I mean the variability as well as the issues of skewness. So you can show your data or analyze your data in many, in diverse ways. Uh, so think about this. Think about this, that is uh, you've collected data, whether it is in, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, it doesn't really matter. You have various ways of presenting this. So I know you have a lot of experience in data processing and presentation. And I know most of us are very vast with uh, various myth, various uh, packages out there. And I think the Microsoft Excel is very powerful in terms of doing this. 
So in my view, if you are well versed with um with Excel, please proceed, analyze, and um I mean, present the data. Sorry, and then importantly, the the statistics in the, the presentation is in the interpretation. You can do a very nice table, you can do a nice graph, but then you fail to make, you fail to say anything about it. Then you have failed completely. So to me, the technique is in the interpretation more than just presentation because you can easily present data in that way. So, so are you going to take us through an overview of the Excel, doing data in Excel? Maybe some of us are not very much, we are just familiar yeah. with this, this. So a deeper part of the Excel. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I think it is it is important because I know Excel is very powerful. Um, what I would I will just I can present the very basics so in Excel, because I will, uh, you can easily sit down and draw. But then, I mean, with Excel, that's what you do for your research. Actually, you collect data. The idea is organization. Organize it, put it in a way that you can be able to now uh, project out there. Uh, a good student is one that really. Uh, does their presentation well. To me, that sells the whole thing. Rather than just uh, throwing things in Excel, they are not formatted, and then they are just thrown into the Word document, and it ends there. Then it's even, even for the reader, they get disinterested. So in, in as far as you know a lot of statistics, it, might, it is important that you work a lot more on this area of presentation more than anything else. Now, like to, I will post some small uh, data sets that, I've, um, that I'll show you in a moment, but think about this uh, data presentations, uh, formats and uh, types, depending on the type of data you have, the, the blue one there are the quantitative data, and then for the qual, whatever you see in green. So for qualitative data, most of you can easily present this in summary tables. From the summary tables, you know how to describe your bar charts, you know how to describe your pie chart. It's even another interesting one referred to as a Pareto diagram. So that can easily be uh, one way of doing it. For people in the quant, it might be important that because the data in quantitative is a bit voluminous, one way is to look at the frequency distribution, which is very powerful. Um, stem and leaf may not be, it be an old technique, but uh, yeah, still good, but not very popular nowadays. We even have a dot plot. Dot plot just is one that just uh, represents the observations in terms of dots. It's very easy. And uh, the histogram you can generate as a result from the frequency distribution. I think these are things we have very con conversant in using Excel. So I'm going to just highlight the qualitative aspects of the same first, but uh, we'll marry both qualitative and quantitative. Just want you to look at this this one. Um, I don't know whether this is my slide, is my data visible surely? Can I, can you see anything? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I'll, we yeah. can see. I have tried to blow it up as much as possible. So we all know that uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the Kenyan map. For those of us who, are, who don't belong, who are not from here, we know that traditionally we used to have professional governments and we used to have eight provinces, the coast, the northeastern, eastern, central Rift Valley, and the rest. You Nowadays, we have the county governments, and uh, you can actually tabulate the number of counties in each of the original provinces. And I'm, I've tried as much as possible to do that. So I just, to just confirm that we can actually... Oh, let's just confirm that these are 47 counties by simply summing them. So equal sign sum. So in Excel, the equal sign 
will prompt all the Excel functions you can ever think about. So the fact that I in I start with an equal sign, then uh, it tells Excel that you want to use one of their functions. So there are many functions in Excel I think you can Google. The one that I want is the one that sums. So if I want to sum this one, I double click on the sum, then activate and sign, um, summing across the board and then I close in brackets. So therefore I have the 47 counties as you can see. All right, now next thing, um, one can even look at the, you can convert this data, it goes is count data then you want to say, well, let me look at this in terms of even through in in terms of proportion. What proportion of the counties are in the western region? Okay, then, well, you can convert this into percentages by looking at the ratios. So for for the coast provinces, the six counties in the western region account for what proportion of the counties? So I can simply do six divided by 47. So I have my equal to. So that divided by the 47 right in here. I can lock this cell by uh, clicking or rather uh, pressing the Fn function and four on the screen so that you can lock it. So dollar sign B, dollar sign 10, meaning that that is locked already. Uh, so it will use that as a common denominator. Once I hit enter, then I can know that we have 13% of the counties falling on in the coast and region. Okay, from there, we can then drag this down up to the last one there. So that gives you the proportions. So I think data presentation um, is critical. In this case, if, if let me extend this to one decimal point by Tapping on this, you increase by one decimal point, we have 2.1 there. So that can be a way of looking at it. Now, um, my expectations are that the data presentation uh, should be something that is very, that should be very easy for you to do. So this is the common one for all of us, I know. Um, we can do your, you can just highlight all of them up to there. Yes, please, somebody wants something. Uh, we need to understand these are to insert the formulas in Excel. Okay, right. Okay, let me let me sketch some of who has done this before. Let me ask if there's someone who understands. We have some technical guys Maureen. in this class. So Maureen. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's have teachers teach teachers. You know, this Maureen that has been proposed. That is what yes. we are here for. <laughs> I have done my 47 right here. Uh, Maureen has been proposed to help us here. Maureen, as you wish for Maureen, there's something I wanted to ask. Uh, yes. This thing, there's something between proportion and death and, uh, and ratio. I think one of them is if researchers are trying to do away with one of them because they say they generate a, de a, a decimal because of the, the, the potential, rather the tendency of the generating decimals. So we, we, the researchers are trying to do away with one of them. But we still okay. have the proportion and ratio. Mm -hmm. Okay. Proportion and ratio. So as, as Maureen comes in, uh, proportion basically is about ratio that is when it comes to you know when i say uh the ratio of uh maybe in in a in a university in a teaching in any university you have you can say the ratio yeah. of overhead maybe. costs ever yeah. overhead costs to the total cost of operation so what it means is that i'm looking at the total cost associated with the indirect, I mean, the indirect costs. If it's administration costs, if it's about um, HR, all these other functions. So I look at all that cost and say, what is the ratio of that over the entire? And indeed, the, in terms of presentation, they may not be any different. This other one, 
what I say ratio, at times you can give it in decimal points. But remember, the same thing can as well be represented in percentage form because that ratio can still be converted into a percentage, like what I've done here, and you are still and you're still speaking the same language. So in to me, in uh, whether you are in whether you use ratios or uh, decimal points or uh, percentages, it communicates the same thing. Communicates the same thing. Just. Uh, um, I think, sorry, I think that is something else I'm trying to get it. Maureen, yeah, let us know what you think. I'm here. Yes, you are here. We can hear. <laughs> I'm just shocked who has mentioned my name. Yeah, <laughs> they <laughs> say that you, are, you have been mentioned here, <laughs> not adversely. <laughs> But in yes. a good way, these Excel functions. What is that? Hmm. Yes. So what's the question? The question is: yes. when you're executing Excel functions, how do you proceed? For instance, what we did here is simply to generate the sum of these counties. Yes. Uh -huh. And I want to put my sum over there. What do I do? Okay, there is a, how do I explain this? Before <laughs> you see where you have sort and filter on the, what is this called? This one on top, home, where you have home. Mm -hmm. Then you don't, you move uh, to the, is it to the right? There is this, you see insert. Yes. Next, that one that looks like an E. Mm -hmm. Drop down there. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> that E there. And there. Uh, do you have your computer? Yes. It's I... called the summation function. Yeah, yes. the summation function. This one. Yeah, it's next to the. No, 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 no. Okay, that mm -hmm. one, or there's another one. There's what another the one. Find and select if you can locate on the menu at the top. Yes. There's the yeah, that one. You click there, then you get the functions there. Correct. Thank you. So one of the things you can as well go right there. There's the submission sign right in here. So if I if, I, if you click this down, uh, if you click that arrow, you can be able to now pick what you want. But make sure that the cell with which you want to execute it must be identified. You must it must be highlighted. For example, this is. B10, meaning you want to do the, the sum, the average, the count, whatever, and record it in this cell. So you can use that as one of the options. The other options is simply to execute it from the Excel functions in here. If I click on that one, you can now see it comes out. All the functionalities will just be appearing here. And you can see by tapping the FX, the formula already equal sign will just pop up automatically. That is one way. So uh, those are two ways. The other way is simply go straight to the cell, type equal sign, and then you must know the list of Excel functions that exist. So um, from there, if it's a average, you simply type average, it will pop up. If it's mean, I mean, if it's sum, all this, if it's counting, you can do count and the rest. So the equal sign executes the FX command right in here or what Maureen just said, the summation sign is right across there. I think that is key, huh? that is important. So in my, in my submissions, even as I encourage you to practice data analysis, please rush to understand Excel a lot more. For most of us who are uh, uh, teachers, you are analysts, you're in the financial sector, whichever way, Excel is Excel. It is the common denominator. I said that last time. Whether you are a qual quant, it doesn't matter. This is important. So here, I have uh, typed equal sign and then SUM. Okay. So all these are functions that are in this FX command, it's very powerful. You can choose whichever one. So 
some if and the rest some products but let's just pick on the first one by double clicking so to execute it it must be double clicked and then you can now see that you want to it even guides you the number one number two up to the end so i need to find the first number right in here and then either i can drag it down to the last when i've reached the last point you even close to the brackets and then the formula is complete then upon that you click enter it will pick up the sum the summation okay once you click enter then the numbers will appear good uh, so there are many other functions that exist in excel which you could as well explore okay um the one that uh, i think uh, hotel was asking is about ratio you can do ratio of each county six sorry I can now say equals to, then you can type your formula six divided by the 47. When I click enter, you can now see that the number is 0 0.27. Now this is a ratio. This is what now Othello was saying, this is now ratio. But you can as well uh, copy this, you can as well convert this into a percentage by simply tapping on this percentage sign. And then the number will just convert itself to a percentage. So if I click on that one and then I hit percentage, that number is already changed to a percentage. But that's why whether it's a ratio or a percentage, it really doesn't matter. It will still give you the same information. To give you the same information. All right. So um, your data presentations, uh, Maureen, let me now go work with you. Where do you get all these presentations? Graphical presentations. Please help, but I think you cannot insert. There is insert there. Okay, insert right. So I must highlight the data, data first. So I highlighted the the entire data set, the provinces, the counties, but I have excluded the sum. Then from there you have all the things you need. You could click on ex uh, insert. Then uh, all these charts are available for you for selection. So I want we you I give you this as your exercise. Uh, learn Excel from the basics. From this one, you can you can depending on what you want to present your data with. At times, you would want to go to the recommended charts. Excel is smart enough to recommend the best way to present that data. So if you click on the recommended charts then the options will be there for you to select. Then there you see, you can now pick on the bar graph. You even have another one there for, I think the, these are clustered bar chart. Depending on one to one, which one you prefer, you can come to the pie chart. This also another funnel representation, so a funnel chart. So all these are available. And there's a last one here called the Pareto chart. Very important as well. So think of the best way to present the data set. If you're not very sure, uh, as a point of reference, just go to the recommended charts. But should you want to have a, a specific one, then you can decide and say, I want to, I want the bar chart right in here, or I want the, the pie chart. So from the pie charts, you can go to the 3D, representation or the 2D. So if you go to the 3D, you can have a better view of it like that. And from there, you it's important that you can as well uh, manipulate this in your own particular way. So I go to labels, if I want to add labels, data labels, so that you can put those labels the way you want. So, so choose the approach that you prefer. If you are the center and the rest. So, I leave this kind of representation for you because I know you are more techno savvy. You understand things better. And at the end of it all, you have a representation. Then after that, you talk about the interpretation. So let me pick the one that I had mentioned earlier. Let me ignore this one. Let me just go to the Pareto chart for now. If you go to the recommended charts, um, this Pareto chart here, comes out like that. 
Okay. So it's a way in which you you look at the cumulative uh, cumulative uh, shares for each of the counties. What you do is you interpret this orange line because you can see it starts somewhere. It all culminates into a hundred. So, for example, it tells you the first two provinces. Actually, the first thing you should know that this Pareto chart arranges the data in a descending order. It will list the, 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 the variable or rather the region with the highest numbers, and then it will do it in a descending order till the end. And then what it does is that it will create a Pareto chart, which is now an accumulative uh, response or rather accumulate, accumulation of the shares. So what will happen is that you'll be interpreting this particular orange line. So for example, the first two regions, so this is where you find up to, you can now read this line across, it's about about 50%. So you can see where it crosses the line here. The first two counties here, or the first two provinces, account, account for up to 50%, or slightly about 50% of the counties. So, and that is, you can you can easily confirm that 20, 14 plus 8 is about 22. It's almost a half, as you can say. So the this is how you consider the interpretation of that. But you look at this particular cumulative uh, graph. So the discussion that has happened in um, in this data presentation for you, I thought this this particular uh, section you could you could uh, run through. Trying to get my slides back. Just a minute. Yeah, so uh, my assumption is that I, I you can be able to find time run through the data presentation uh, in Excel. And I think that is what I recommend for you so that as we begin the other things, we can work mechanically, uh, understanding the mean, averages, and the rest. So this is, just want to just show you what we just did. So this is about the the frequency table, you already have this type of uh, data set. You can, we have shown those numbers. So you you know the bar graph, how to do it. You can do the simple bar graph, counting and the rest. But then the idea is, are you able to explain, for instance, uh, about, I mean, the Rift Valley has a, account for about 14 of the counties. Nairobi has a single county and the rest. So think about how you can beautify, beautifully describe it in your good English. So all these things show, meaning you, you have a different way of interpreting to about it. So if your work is organized, you put it in a structured manner, present to the reader in a way in which they can be able to visually see and then talk about those numbers. Then it makes it easier for everybody. So allow me to ask you, I'll post this data. You will run through some of this uh, Excel data set in here. Go to the charts, insert the charts, and then see what you can come out with at the end of it all. Right. Good. Any questions? We will pick it up from here. But I wanted you to just have some moment before you leave. You answer those very two very short questions. Uh, tell us what you can pick in terms of the data types. I want to hope that it is uh, you're able to log in with e-learning. Please log into e-learning, see what it is before we are logged out. Uh, I can see politically Nairobi that is suffering from skewedness. It is a place which generates more revenue, but it has got more one county. But one county. 
Yeah, we don't <laughs> want to increase the number of counties. <laughs> but there are, there, are counties, there are counties that are not economically viable, but they have this. <laughs> <laughs> now this is now qualitative researcher talking thank you othello <laughs> now we are giving you the numbers you can now talk about it and that is for our allow me to ask you uh, if you can uh, access the learning as answer those very simple questions two of them I want to see whether we have understood these concepts of levels of measurement. I don't know, Dr. Harry, whether it's just me, but from my end, it says this quiz is currently not available. Ah, uh, yes, yes, it's it's right. It's not available at eight o'clock. Eh? Yeah, when it's eight okay, sharp, it will you. be available. Um, Dr. Harry. Yes. Yes, please. Doctor, um, um, there's an issue. Um, yeah. with my, there's an issue with my dual again? online uh, uh, sites. So yeah. I, I will not be able to do this quiz today. Will you allow me to do it next week because they cannot access any of my courses for this time in the dual online. So if you would allow me to do it next week, then that would be good. Ah, uh, 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 uh. no, because it's only three minutes to go. Uh, it means you have you not registered? Have, um, but there are issues. I don't know, so I'll have to go to school and inquire first. And I'm still here. interesting. Now, if you are not accessing this, then I think that the ones who have access send it to her. Hi, uh, doctor. The first is email you. Yeah. So there are people that have, uh, I, I, unless I confirm with Dr. Yuya, let me, let me get the list of those of us who are not able to. Then uh, the ones that can please proceed. Dr. Ring? Yes, please. Yeah, we had the first question. We had the first question that uh, required us to to use either the, the panel data or the cross-sectional data, it's disappeared now, it's not there. Yeah, that, that, one, is for, that one is for discussion question. It is not okay. the one. Yeah, okay. I can I can still repost that one because it was for discussion. Okay. The, the one that is open for you is the one for the quizzes. But I will still, I can, I will repost that one so that it can be running for this week. For those that are saying that uh, they are not able to access, then I need to have your details. It is there, but not available. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Unless now I, I change a little bit, bring it back by a minute. I think it was designed to start exactly on the dot. Okay. Yeah, just breathe in, breathe out. <laughs> so it's three minutes I... to take about two minutes to time. Excuse me, Dr. Terry. Yes. Um uh, during our previous uh term we had requested when we're doing cuts or assignments they be communicated sometime earlier since some of us are not always at home at this particular time. Some may be driving yeah. others. Uh, planning mm -hmm. to catch up with our lecture later on, as we were told, this uh, is purely online and whatnot, sir. Okay, no, fine. Just, uh, you know, in my assessment, it will be, this will not be the only, as in, what we'll be doing is that uh, occasionally, we may not necessarily tell you this will be great, but uh, for you to just practice, eh? then we'll be assessing many things at the same time. So anyway, in the, in the next time, we'll do that. Okay, thank fine. you. Yeah, well, now let's just do what we can. There are only two simple questions. And the ones that are not there, we will still, we will not, we will not lock you out either way. Hello, Dr. Mm -hmm. Yes. At the, 
uh, were the notes for the previous class posted anywhere? The notes, not the video. Yes, there were the I as far as I know, the notes were posted. Don't they? Mm -hmm. Zico week one. You could end week one introduction to statistics. Okay, thank you. Ah. How long is the is the quiz? You can even finish in five minutes and go home. <laughs> we are home. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Not everybody, some of us have to pack so that we do the quiz. Oh Brian, <laughs> we hear you. <laughs> Forgive me, but yes. <laughs> okay, we find Brian. Thank you. It has taken me to proceed with the training. So what are the questions, Doctor, if you can help me? Let me hear. Is there any, uh, there were two questions, so. It's, it's telling me proceed with the training. So once I open a quiz question, they tell me proceed with the training. Yes, they should proceed. Okay. Yeah, yeah, can you keep, uh, proceed? We see what happens. It's opening now. If you go to do online, do online. Uh -huh. It is opening now. And I'm seeing that it's thirty-two. We are already there. Theta, I think you should be okay. Could we stop talking, please? Thank you. Hello, Dr.
daktari ata kuske ya just ask am i allowed to leave the meeting i've completed the quiz Yeah. Once you're done, you are free to leave. Okay, thank you.
have a good night. God bless.